in the tradition of Sanatana Dharma, it, it speaks of um, the ways that the divine enters into the material world. And the philosophical summary of that is they call it the eight manifestations of the divine. And in my life experience, and I've said this to some of you, um, there's a few things that I think are essential to having a solid understanding of how to progress on the road to enlightenment. And, you know, there's traditional ways of saying it too. I speak of what, what is karma, what, what is reincarnation, what is the chakra system. It's also very helpful to understand the yugas, which is the ages of rising and falling consciousness on planet Earth, because it makes us more relaxed about the world outside of us. But the other, which I have not mentioned until now, is the eight manifestations of the divine. Because we say, oh, I want to be a channel for the light, I want to be a channel for God, especially the word God, I want to be a channel for God, or I want to be a channel for the divine. But what exactly does that mean? And what does that look like when it's a matter of me? You know, I, uh, I grew up in the Jewish tradition and I vividly remember the, uh, the movie The Ten Commandments, which was really quite a blockbuster when I was a child. And there's some point in there where Moses is on Mount Sinai and as the joke goes, Moses was the first uh, person to download onto a tablet something from the cloud. <laughs> but, uh, you know, they have him up there and, and they just trying to make it feel like it's God. There's thunder, there's lightning, you know, there's just like this terrible t tumult going on. And out of all of that, you know, the light comes down and it strikes the tablets of the Ten Commandments, and then Moses staggers down the hill, you know, and presents it to the Jewish people who have, have, who have become debauched in his absence, which is really unfortunate. You know, they're worshiping the golden calf, and he's been on the... On, anyway, it's a mess. Like, what, what am I supposed to do with that, really? You know, I can't even grow a beard. I'm not a man. What can I do? So, what is it that we're really talking about? So, again, I was commenting that one of the geniuses that I experienced in my 40-some years with Swami Kriyananda was he could take something very abstract and make it very concrete. And that, that's not the right word. He could take something very abstract and he could prove the principle as above, so below. So that if it's true on the highest level, there's an actual accessible truth that we can also find in the world that we know. As an example, um, people always ask, why did God create this world? Because from our perspective, great parts of it seem like a really bad idea, right? And one of the um, classic explanations is so that he could enjoy himself through many. And the obvious protest is, well, he doesn't seem to be enjoying himself through very many, so it seems like a pretty bad idea. But Swamiji put it quite differently. Um, now, the Sanskrit synonym for God, the best synonym, is Satchitananda. It means ever-existing, ever-conscious, ever-new joy. Isn't that beautiful? Ever-existing, no fear that will be taken away from us, ever-conscious, which means that we are aware, we are aware of it. It's not that joy is out there somewhere, but we are aware of it, ever-existing, ever-conscious, and then Yogananda refined it, ever new joy. Because otherwise we think joy itself might become tiresome, <laughs> but ever new. So when we, when we think of well, part of the limitation of speaking English is the word God has no meaning in English. And it has no experiential meaning. We can, we can get a theology, but ever existing, ever conscious, ever new joy, we understand at least dimly what that might mean. So Swamiji then said, it's the nature of joy to want to share itself. Because joy is increased when it shares itself. Think of the most ordinary circumstance. Perhaps you will enjoy today. And then you will tell someone about the books you read, or the things that you learned, or the, the resources that you discovered. Or let's say you don't enjoy today, but maybe you went to a 
wonderful restaurant last night. You've probably told somebody about it already, haven't you? Because when you enjoy something, it's the nature of joy to want to share itself. So we we take something that's so elevated and we bring it right down to where we're standing. Thus the eight manifestations of God. The, and, and these are the classic qualities. You may argue for, you may advocate for a ninth or a tenth if you wish, but these eight work. And the, the thing about it, and this is what, what the rest of the day is going to be, is we're going to go through these and we're going to try to understand them conceptually, then we're going to try to experience them through music, and then we're going to uh, deepen that with silence. And that's the pattern that will follow. And each one of them, this, this is how it works this way. The, the, the manifestations are love, um, joy, peace, calmness, which is different than peace, because you can be very calm in the midst of chaos, which is a very useful quality. Calmness is calm. Love, a joy, peace, calmness, energy, which can also be defined as power, but energy is an easier way to understand it. Energy, wisdom, light, and sound. Now, what happens is, when, this is why these are so important. When we begin to understand the nature of each of these qualities, now bear in mind, this is, so to speak, the radio program that is constantly emanating from the infinite source. This is God's presence in this world. And it's not that, you know, as soon as I become calm, I become God. It's more like this is the vibration of the Spirit. And when we and when we tune in to that vibration coming in, that's what it means to be a channel for God. Because we don't have the wisdom or the freedom or the power. Jesus, who was fully realized, uh, you know, oh, this man is blind, I think I'll help him to see. Oh, this man is dead, I think I'll bring him back to life. You know, he could do all kinds of things where he could just play with this planet. But he was, he was channeling the same energies. And he was applying them as was appropriate. To, to raise the dead was a manifestation of divine power, wasn't it? To decide that it was appropriate to do was a manifestation of wisdom. Because, well, Yogananda himself had the power also to bring people back. Even though they had absented their bodies, he could draw them back into their bodies if it was appropriate. And in one case, he was in, when he was in India as a younger man, he was walking down the street and he, there was a house where someone had died and he went in. He asked to be alone with the person who had just absented and he pulled them back. And the person said that they were sort of wandering in the, a field, I believe, of flowers and they heard their name being called. And then all of a sudden they were back in the body. When Yogananda told that story to Kriyananda, Swamiji said, you know, what, what called you to do it? Why did you do that? He said, oh, Divine Mother told me to. If she hadn't told me, I never would have. Because it wasn't his job to always defy death, but wisdom inspired him to know that this was a time when that power should be used. So power, love, and wisdom. And a certain calmness when you walk into a house and say, excuse me, your dead person isn't really dead. <laughs> But in India at that time, the fact that he was a Swami and had this extraordinary aura, you know, many things could happen. Could happen here, too, of course. Um, So when we understand the vibration of each of these, see, what this also gives us is this gives us a very dynamic, always expansive way of increasing our awareness and always serving as a channel, instead of just using conventional habit and psychological subconsciousness to just do what we always do. We stop and we ask, and this is the wisdom aspect of it, we stop and we ask, we ask two questions. What would benefit this moment, and what am I capable of doing? You see, and both of those questions are extremely important, because sometimes we just get lost in abstractions. And we lose the wisdom of humility and try to do something 
that is not ours to do because it's beyond our level of awareness to do it. I mean, I could ask all the servants in the, at the wedding feast to fill many jars with water and I could pray over them, but when they opened them, likely they would still be water. You know, because Jesus knew that he could turn the water into wine. It can be done in theory, but it can't be done by me. But I might be able to cheer people up about the fact that there was no more wine. <laughs> because I could be happy whether we're drinking wine or not. That might be, or I might help the host to be calm over the fact that there's no more wine and his guests are about to revolt. You see, each, in every situation, always one of those eight manifestations is available to us. Even if it's only the wisdom to know there's nothing I can do to help this. And so our, our idea of being a channel of the divine um, moves from an abstraction to an extremely accessible, practical way to live. And you see what that does for us also is that there's always a way forward. And, and that's the, the, what, what is one of the most fun aspects of embracing a spiritual path like this one, which is every, every moment can be used productively to expand my awareness and to, con- to increase the flow of abundance through me, to be serviceful, to have a meaningful life, and in the process to train myself always to be thinking in an upwardly moving way. Because what what we have to understand, and I said this, and I want to say it again forcefully, um, what I am talking about is not a creative use of imagination. These are actual living realities. These are the radio programs that are constantly being projected into the universe we live in. They're being literally projected by saints and masters in the astral world who are trying to take care of us. Um, I have read many accounts which I, for many reasons, believe are credible in addition to what Yogananda and Kriyananda say. We are never alone. If we could but see it, we are constantly surrounded by angelic forces and saints and masters who are cheering us on, but they will not invade, they will not force us to accept their presence. They merely radiate and and we have to align ourselves with them. So it's a very interesting blend of our willpower and the grace of God. And, And what we have to do in order to build faith in these realities is to conduct the right experiment. And so, that's what we're going to do today. We'll start with the quality of love, which is always a good starting point, isn't it? Um, There is a a statement in the New Testament, which I actually, because I was raised in a Jewish family, I never read the New Testament. I didn't read the Old Testament either. We were just cultural (laughs) Jews. We were cultural rather than religious. That's a very deep identity, whether you're what's, you know, we have all kinds of words like, we're we're not practicing Jews, but we're still, that doesn't make you not Jewish. In any case, um, uh, I I was, I started on this path when I was 18, just before my 19th birthday, a book by Swami Vivekananda, the foremost disciple of an avatar in the 1800s, Ramakrishna. And I was given his book, and in his book it said, Perfect love casts out all fear. And for most of my life, I thought that was his statement. Later, when I studied the New Testament, I found out actually it's from the Bible, St. John in the Bible. Whether Vivekananda discovered it on his own or it's whether St. John got it from someone else, I don't know. Perfect love casts out all fear. I was very, very nervous at that stage of my life. Ner- the, and certain what they call... Uh, I went formless anxiety, you know, is sort of one of the things that I've had to work my way through. So anything that talked to me about fear, about the antidote to it, was of extreme interest to me. So the power of that simple idea has caused me to be very interested always in how that could work. 
And so, of course, we have remarkable examples of how people can tame wild animals, you know, can, can calm an angry storm. Um, but the power of love that we're talking about is, well, it's, it's very closely tied to compassion. And this is what I was saying about how we sort of can find incorporated in all of this. When, when we fear someone, it's almost always because we think that they can do something to us that's harmful. And we separate ourselves immediately from them, don't we? They become other, we become barricaded against them. But um, we can also you know, see them in a very different light, feel this great compassion. Recently I was telling, and I'll tell it again, this story. There, there's two remarkable women who made themselves known through the Second World War. They were deeply devoted Christians in Holland and in the Netherlands when uh, Germany, the, the Nazi forces just took over the Netherlands and began to um, exterminate, try to exterminate the Jews. And they felt great love and compassion for the Jewish people. And even though they were, they were spinster sisters, elderly, in their 50s probably when this happened, and their, and their father, their, uh, and there was tremendous danger in what they were doing. I mean, you can imagine. They started a huge underground movement, and they, they rescued Jewish people who would other have been in, in, uh, incarcerated. They spirited them out of the country. Um, and because they were just these two funny spinster women, it took a long time for anybody to realize what they were actually doing. And some of the Jewish people were too Semitic in the way that they looked. And so other people were afraid to take them in, or they were too hard to, to take out. So the most dangerous ones to shelter, they took into their own home. Now, let's talking about love, casting out fear. Now, of course, there was anxiety in what they were doing. They could not have, have been so foolish as to not to know what their jeopardy was. But their love was much greater than that. They just could not allow people to suffer. The compassion they felt really moved them. Now sometimes the principle is proven in the exaggeration of it, or the extreme example of it. And in the end they were betrayed, and in the end they were incarcerated. The father died immediately. The older sister, Betsy, died before they were liberated, and only Corey of the three of them survived. At the end of Betsy's life in the concentration camp, um, Betsy started telling Corey that after the war was over there were going to be so many damaged people in the world because she could see it in vision. She could see the future. You're going to have to, you're going to establish a safe house and all of these damaged souls will come and you'll have to take care of them and you'll have to restore them. You'll have to pray for them. You'll have to talk about the love of Jesus, which she said, uh, you have to tell people that no darkness is so dark or deep that the love of, of Jesus is not deeper still. And then looking at where they were, she said, and they will believe you because you've been here. And so Corey listened to all of that and was amazed and, and then, and she assumed that Betsy was telling her that they would have to take care of the Jewish people once they got liberated because that's what they'd been doing all along. And she realized that Betsy was talking about the Nazis. And these people had, you know, murdered their friends and their family and... But Betsy, all Betsy could see was compassion for how much they were going to suffer. And in fact, much to her credit, and it took great strength from Corey, she actually did that. And they helped as many of the ex-Nazis as they helped the Jews to just move beyond this. Now, in our little world, you know, when we love someone, love is a powerful motivating force. And the most powerful motivating force we see it is the parents' love for the children. You know, it's just, I've never given birth to children in this life. 
but I understand it and I see it in all of my friends. You know, one of my friends told me before his children were born, he said he thought he was a, a selfless person, and he was. He was generous, he was kind. After his sons were born, he said he had no idea what true love really was. Because prior to that, he'd always been holding something of himself back. But once his sons were born, his own life ceased to matter for him. And how many stories do we have of parents just intervening in stunningly courageous ways, where they they don't even think for a moment about the cost to themselves, because love casts out all fear. When I... uh, let me just think. Oh yes, this was a moment. This was a very... Now, I'm going to give you a very simple story. Uh, a friend of mine, uh, she died of cancer in her 30s. She was the... Actually, was probably the first person I knew who died. She died very young. She was a very feisty person. She was also quite small. Um, Swami used to call her a bantam rooster. She was really a feisty person. And... Uh, And she had been very rebellious against her own family, especially against her father. Her own mother had died young of cancer, too. And her father became, as parents would be, extremely protective. She did not like, his name was Jake, she did not like his interference in her life, and she ran away from him as soon as she could and made her own life with us. And, uh, but then she's dying, and of course her, her father is beside himself. First he loses his wife, now he's losing his daughter. And she was within our our Ananda community, and the very generous-hearted woman who was sheltering Mary brought Jake to live in her house too, because Jake needed to be there. So my friend Paula, who was an angel and trained me in angelic ways that I didn't understand how to do, she knew how to do, Susan, Paula, and I wanted to go visit Mary. So we call up the house. Jake answers the phone. Paula says, we want to come see Mary. Jake says, Mary's too tired. She doesn't want to see you. And uh, Paula tries something, and Jake just says, no, slams the phone down. Jake, it's not even Jake's house. He slams the phone down. So we have a little conference. We agree that Mary never wanted Jake to run her life when she had the energy to rebel. And it's very unlikely that she wants him to run her life now that she's dying. So we just decide we're just going to go anyway. So we go to the door. We ring the doorbell. I think whoever was the mistress of the house wasn't there. Jake answers the door again. He sees us. I told you not to come like this. I had the sense to stand at the back. (laughs) Paula knows just from her heart everything that Jake is experiencing. Absolutely everything. And she says, all she says is, Jake, we had to come. And Jake again rails at us, you know, blah, 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 like this. Unfaced, Jake, we had to come. Not a breath of censure, not a breath of judgment, just totally, she just loved the man because she knew he was suffering. That's all she projected. Three times they did it. And finally, Jake says, well, don't stay very long. <laughs> you know, And he just let us in. What would I have done? I would have tossed a thousand words at Jake and tried to persuade him, which is just what he wanted. He probably would have punched me out before it was over. <laughs> but because I wasn't capable of loving him in that circumstance. But she was. So always ask that question. Now, here's another example. I, I used to have a habit of procrastination, and I was doing essentially the same work I'm doing now, but I was organizing tours. I was setting up things for months in advance. And I always had this, like, what if I don't want to do it, you know, three months from now? And so I would always procrastinate at committing myself. I've gradually overcome it, but it was very hard for me. If you're setting up a six-week lecture tour, you've got to commit. You've got to make plans and make it work. So I would procrastinate and just not quite make it happen. So a friend of mine watched me do this, and they knew this was not going to help me. So the only thought they had about why I would be so inept 
was that I didn't understand the terrible consequences of my procrastination. This was a misuse of the concept of wisdom. (laughs) So they sat down with me and tried to talk to me about all the terrible things that would happen if I didn't just, for gosh sakes, just make a decision and stand by it. And the more they told me about the awful things that would happen, the more terrified I became. Because my problem was fear. And wisdom was not strong enough to overcome it. And finally I was, I was wise enough, because wisdom is one of the things that I like, to say, I know, I know, but I'm afraid. I need somebody to comfort me, you know? Don't try to use wisdom. Just love me. Tell me that I can do it. You know, give me, give me, uh, be a friend. And fortunately, my friend understood perfectly and ever thereafter, always, whenever they saw me behaving like an idiot, they always knew that the problem was fear and the antidote was love. Just like that. And, you know, even just in small ways, we don't have to be dramatic, we don't have to raise the dead, we don't have to be dealing with life and death. But when somebody is in front of you and you can tell they need something, love is often all that we need. And I learned from my own experience, I learned that almost always people know what they're doing wrong and know what they should do right. They're just afraid. And what is the antidote to fear? Love is the antidote to fear. You don't even have to like the person. I'm not talking about liking people. I'm talking about projecting the divine love to them. Now bear in mind, it's not me loving them. You know, Jake was a very unpleasant person. (laughs) But Paula loved through his personality to the divine spark that was in him. That was itself also seeking the same thing that we were seeking, like this. So, if it's accessible to you. You see, and everybody has different qualities. You know, full disclosure, someone asked me once, which had never been asked before, what are your favorites of the eight manifestations? And I actually thought for a moment, and I said, joy and wisdom. That's what I like. But many, and then the person who asked me said, oh, my favorite is love. You know? So, so this also gives us a chance to be the unique force that Divine Mother wants wants us to be. When I was with Paula, I had the sense to know that joy and wisdom were not going to get us anywhere. It was intuitive, because I hadn't thought it out yet. And Paula was all about love. And she just, that's how she, she looked at anything in the world, and that's how she saw it. And she just loved it. And it worked for her. Okay, that's to be an instrument of God. So, let's now have a little bit of music. We'll, we'll, We'll have a chant. Then we'll have a song, one of Swami Kriyananda's songs. Door of my heart, open wide I keep for thee. Door of my heart, open wide I keep for thee. Wilt thou come, wilt thou come, just for once come to me. Wilt thou come, wilt thou come, just for once come to me? Will my days fly away with 
song. Oh, my heart's a fire, burning all desire. Only you remain and life again. Love is all I know, sun rays on the snow of a winter long in dark without song. Oh, my heart's a fire, burning all desire. Only you remain and life again. Too long I did stray, flung lifetimes away. Imagined you did not care. I know now your smile was mine all the while. I listened and love was there. I can't breathe for love. All the stars above call to me, come home. Life's waves all end in foam. Only love can heal all the pain I feel. What a fool was I to turn away. Love is all I know, sun rays on the snow of a winter long. In darkness without song Oh, my heart's a fire Burning all desire Only you remain And life again Swami Kriyananda had a 
extremely good sense of humor, and he always enjoyed um, humorous repartee, and he was very witty, and uh, Master was the same. He said, in Master's company, um, Master was always bubbling over with joy. In Swami Kriyananda's autobiography, which is called The New Path, which is half the book is what it was like to live with Yogananda, and there aren't many accounts. So if you've read Autobiography of a Yogi but haven't read Kriyananda's book, you might find it very interesting. And he talked about how Master loved to tell jokes, and he said often with his thick Bengali accent and the fact that he found his own joke so amusing he would start laughing before he'd finished it. He said sometimes you really weren't quite sure what the punchline was. But his um, enjoyment and his laughter was so infectious, Swamiji said, you just found yourself swept up into it and just laughing without even knowing why you were laughing because the joy that was coming out of Master, as I call him, was so um, impossible to resist. And Swamiji carried on that tradition. His whole personality and way of relating to us Early on, I said to him, you know, when you do something in a certain way, that's because Yogananda did it that way, isn't it? He said, of course. I said, and when you refrain from certain actions, that's because how Yogananda behaved. Swami said, of course. How else would I know who I'm supposed to be, meaning how to live according to the divine, except in the way that Yogananda inspired him to do? Um, I being cut a little bit from the same cloth in terms of humor and witticism and and enjoyment of that. Um, I was with Swamiji and we were standing on the balcony of a a guest facility where we were staying. We were looking down at the swimming pool. The swimming pool was right next to the ocean and there was a little bit of that sort of uh, scum that, that builds up on a swimming pool sometimes. And Swamiji said, what's that on the pool, the, the, white, the stuff on the pool? I said, white caps, meaning, you know, like it was the tide coming in, in this little tiny pool. And I just said that without even thinking. He asked a perfectly sane question. I gave him a silly answer, which at the moment was funnier than it should have been. But anyway, we laughed. And, uh, I, and then I suddenly just wondered. I said, sir, what is humor? Like, why, do, why do, am I inclined to do that instead of just giving you a straight answer? And it was interesting what he said. And this is an aspect of joy, is laughter. He said, to a certain extent, the um, capacity to enjoy humor and to make humorous remarks is a spiritual quality for this reason. Because it shows that you are flexible enough in your sense of reality that you can look at a situation and then just turn it into something else. A simple question about a swimming pool became the absurd possibility that there were tides and waves going in. But we just shifted. We weren't fixed in it. So part of what the aspect of joy is, is to not allow the apparent reality to become the only reality. Because the the nature of the divine is Satchitananda, ever existing, ever conscious, ever new joy. And in all circumstances, joy is accessible to us if we either go deep enough into ourselves to find that, which is why we practice meditation, because in meditation we discover the underlying truth of ourselves outside of the external. And the, um, and the other is to have a flexible enough perception of reality to just be able to realize this is just temporary. Everything just comes and goes, and it will all resolve in bliss. This is what we begin to understand both from experience and from the profound study of the teachings. In a, in a very difficult situation, there was, there was a, a, a period that lasted more than a decade when Ananda, was, uh, Ananda and Swami Kriyananda personally were um, persecuted profoundly through the legal system in the United States. Um, at that time, there, were, there was another very strong group of disciples of Yogananda who felt that they had exclusive rights to his teaching. Swami Kriyananda felt as a direct disciple that he also had equal rights. So an effort was made through the law courts to use 
intellectual property, trademark, copyright, um, publicity rights to a deceased personality, you know, so to, to sort of turn what was really a theological dispute into a legal dispute. And then it went into character assassination, accusing Swami of profound misconduct, everything that you would say against a leader. It was a horrible, tough time. There's two parts of it I want to tell. First, I'll tell the end point. After 12 years of this, um, which was, was, wasn't fun, the opposition lawyers were the kind of lawyers that give really, really, really bad names to the profession, really bad names. And so it was hard. It was very hard and very unfair, blah, blah. Um, after it was over, I waited to become innocent and cheerful again. <laughs> and I just began to realize, and, and a decade had gone by, so I was a decade older. I must have been around, yeah, I was probably around 50 at that point. And I, uh, I came to what I now call the drop, the drop kick theory of spiritual life which is totally the gospel according to Asha, and nobody says this except me. In soccer, which I've never played, you, you hold the ball like that, and you, you drop it, and then you give it a big kick, and then it, I've seen on television it sails for a long time, and sometimes it hits the ground, and then sometimes it bounces and rolls a little bit. And I don't exactly know what the rules are. In, in American football, for some reason, everybody huddles around and lets the ball do its thing, and nobody touches it. So it moves for a while, and then it finally stops, okay? I feel when we're launched in, in each incarnation, Divine Mother or Heavenly Father, whoever prefers, <laughs> gives you a drop kick of, of happy momentum. And depending on the power of that kick, it can go for a long time, it can bounce, it can roll for a while, but at a certain point it comes to a dead stop. And it during the course of my, those 12 years of having to be in court and do all these, just, it was awful. Um, it's like the momentum of my drop kick ran out. And when it was over, I, it was very interesting to me. I just waited for, for spontaneous joy to come back to me. And it was very interesting. I realized it didn't. It just didn't come back. I'd always been very lighthearted and cheerful, but I would had seen the dark side of humanity and been through a lot of things I never hoped to go through. And uh, I realized that Swamiji had given a series of, of seminars around the country, and it was called The Practice of Joy. And he said he, he, it, it was a very hard point to get across to people that joy is a deliberate practice. It's not something that just comes on us unbidden. It's a decision we make. I also realized I was about 50 at that point, and I could see, oh, you know, the, draw, the momentum has, has finished. I don't have all the optimism, uh, the, uh, the innocence of lack of experience about what life is like. I can't just be happy because everybody's nice, because I know now that not everybody is nice, right? I didn't have the energy or the... I still have lots of energy, but I didn't have the same energy I'd had. I have to make joy a conscious practice. I have to really decide. Otherwise, oh, guess what? I'll just get old. I mean, what is it that happens? What is it that characterizes old people a lot? <laughs> I mean, that's what it is. They've just... They've stopped practicing joy because the momentum, the automatic momentum has run out. We don't have to be like that. Joy is a deliberate practice. It's looking at every situation, and this is where wisdom and energy come into this also, and asking myself, where is the joy in this? What can I find? What can I find deep? Now, going back to the actual litigation, <coughs> we were... Um, we were in a certain point in the legal process and we were in a trial and <clears throat> all of us, <coughs> the way the American legal system works, if you're going to be a witness later in a trial, you can be excluded from the courtroom so that you won't uh, adjust your testimony to the testimony that you've already heard. This is the, the theory of it. So the other side basically put all of us, 
on the potential witness list, even though they never called us. But that isolated Swami in the court in the courtroom and left all of us in the hall. So there, so there was this one particular day where this, and and by this time, without boring you, there had been a great number of <clears throat> decisions that hobbled our ability to defend ourselves, which surprise surprise resulted in a wrong verdict. But um, so Swami had to go through this uh, questioning from this horrible attorney. Uh, with his own ability to defend himself, nobbled, and most of the people who were his supporters in the hall, not in the courtroom. So it was an awful morning, probably just awful. So there's about 20 of us out in the hall, and we're just stuck there. We can't do anything. After two or three hours, Swami finally comes out. Immediately, we just rushed around him. This is our spiritual father and our best friend. And, you know, it just all was awful. Now, I have to back up a little bit. I'm sure the James Bond movies have been, James Bond movies are popular in New Zealand, or at least known. The original James Bond movies back in, you know, back when I was a youngster, (laughs) were were more fun. You know, violence wasn't so graphic, morality wasn't so disintegrated. So they were just fun. They were just a lighthearted romp. And Swamiji enjoyed them, and we often went to see them. And one of the many characteristics of the suave James Bond was he had a very particular way of having his martini created for him. And he wanted it to be stirred, not shaken, like that, okay? So this was a a phrase that we all knew from the James Bond movies. So Swami walks out, and he looks a little pale. It had been pretty much of an ordeal. And he's standing there, we're all around him, and someone, you know, just says, Sir, how do you feel? And he goes like this, stirred, but not shaken, like that. (laughs) It was perhaps the darkest moment of our lives together. And in that moment, he just said that. We burst out laughing, much to the great dismay of the opposition attorney who was really hoping. We just burst out laughing. When we finally stopped laughing, he said, well, where should we go for lunch? You know, joy is a deliberate practice. There was everything about that situation was to be depressed. But why should we be depressed? You know, if it's not the happy ending, it's not over yet. I mean, death may come, imprisonment, everything could come. Loss of reputation, loss of money, all those things can happen. But everything ultimately resolves in bliss. Because it's our true, it's our own nature to be blissful. This is what every master says. And we can always find that. Sometimes we find it more in the worst moments because all we have left is our own consciousness. But we won't find it if we don't practice. Because practice makes permanent. <laughs> So we we have to really look at ourselves. Master even said, if you're feeling sad, he said, stand in front of the mirror and push the corners of your mouth up. Right? Like that. (laughs) He said, it's that important. I mean, it's just so silly, isn't it? You know, push the corners of your mouth up. But he's just trying to get us to see. And I, I will remind you, as I have said elsewhere, there's this poem that Master wrote, it's called uh, Samadhi. Samadhi means the realization of God, the final freedom. It's a very long poem, it's very dramatic. Vanish the veils of light and shade, lifted every vapor of sorrow. And then it talks about, uh, uh, you know, anger, greed, good, bad, salvation, lust. I swallowed and transmuted all into a vast ocean of blood of my own one being. I mean, it's pretty dramatic, like that. And it goes on and on for many, many lines. Master told us actually to memorize it and then repeat it when we're meditating because it has tremendous power and goes through all of this rise and fall and living and dying and all these different things. It finally comes to the end, the last lines. A tiny bubble of laughter. I have become the sea of mirth itself. Amazing. All of this adventure 
all of this adventure, the end of it is that we have increased our awareness and we realize that this is just waves on the ocean and what we thought was really ourselves and what we thought was really the end and what we thought was really, you know, this time I'm crushed and I will never rise again. It's never true. Because always underneath it, Satchitananda, that's all that there is. And that doesn't mean it's always easy or pleasurable. And so you have to understand that joy is not lilting happiness. Swami made some good jokes at, at, at really opportune times that were really helpful. But real joy is something quite different. Real joy is just understanding that if it hasn't resolved into bliss, it's not yet over. And when you can hold that, and just what you're holding then, and what you're giving to others, I mean, and sometimes you just bring to the situation a really good joke at the opportune moment. You know, like Swami just, at the opportune moment, he just saw it from a different perspective. He was stirred, but he wasn't shaken. He was still Master's disciple, and he wasn't afraid. Okay, sometimes you can just do that. But sometimes the joy has to be under the surface. People around you are weeping. Great tragedy is happening around you. But that joy translates into a kind of, well, it's a vibration that all is not lost. That under here, joy is a, is a form of faith, you see. Because if you can still feel the possibility of joy, that means we haven't lost hope, have we? And we haven't lost faith that the divine is still present and will come through. A deliberate practice, a decision we make. That's the power of joy. Another line from Yogananda's poem, Samadhi, is, From joy I came, for joy I live, in sacred joy I melt again. From joy I came, for joy I live, in sacred joy I melt again. From joy I came, for joy I live, in sacred joy I melt again. From joy I came, for joy I live, in sacred joy I melt again. From joy I came, for joy I live, in sacred joy I melt again. From joy I came, for joy I live, in sacred joy I melt again. From joy I came, for joy I live, in sacred joy I melt again. From joy I came, for joy I live, in sacred joy I melt again. From joy I came, for joy in sacred joy I melt again. From joy I came, for joy I live. In sacred joy I melt again. From joy I came, for joy I live. In sacred joy I melt again. From joy I came, for joy I live. In sacred joy I melt again. From joy I came, for joy I live, in sacred joy I melt again. From joy I came, for joy I live, in sacred joy I melt again. From joy I came, for joy I live, in sacred joy I melt again. From joy I came, for joy I live, in sacred joy I melt again. From joy I came, for joy I live. In sacred joy I melt again. From joy I came, for joy I live. In sacred joy I melt again. From joy I came, for joy I live. In sacred joy from joy I came, for joy I live, in sacred joy I melt again. From joy I came, for joy I live, in sacred joy I melt again. Thank you.
The next quality we want to talk about is the quality of peace. And we have to understand that we're not talking about um, low energy, because one of the qualities we're also going to talk about is energy. We're not talking about sinking below the level of awareness where we're just not even putting out enough energy to feel bad. Because sometimes people can mistake lethargy for peace. So you're not really peaceful, you've just given up the effort and have shut your awareness down to the point where you're not suffering anymore. That's why if you ask people, are you happy? Most people will say, yeah, I'm happy. <laughs> no. But it's not happy or, it's not on the dynamic level that is really fulfilling to us. And that doesn't have to be outward, but it, it's, it's an inward level of, a very, it's a very high vibration, that's what I'm wanting to say. So the quality of peace we're talking about, I mean, is the quality, uh, thinking, thinking it through, um, it's, it's the quality of self-acceptance is what I really think that peace, that's where peace comes from, which is I've done everything that I can and it, it is what it is. You see, all of these are also laced with faith. You can see how they're all involved with each other. I've been involved for the last several years in the responsibilities that I have in a very confusing situation in which there, in which there is a lot at stake. I have been struggling with it to, to be at peace with the situation for a number of years while it has been going on. And as I progress through the different uh, levels of, of introspection and of experience, I gradually come to realize that what causes me not to be at peace with it is the idea that I could do more. Or maybe I've made a mistake and if I were only different. And so if there's an agitation in the heart and then there's an agitation in the mind, the agitation in the mind always starts in the heart. But if we know that God is in charge, that I've done everything I can, or maybe I've made a terrible mess of it, but it seemed like a good idea at the time. One of my favorite mantras is, it seemed like a good idea at the time, because it always does, or else we wouldn't do it. And to be able to be at peace with who we are and how we've lived, including all of the mistakes that we've made, which if we're, if we're thoughtful at all, we're going to find out that there's a lot of them. One of the things that the masters tell us over and over again <clears throat> that happens <clears throat> when realization comes is we realize that it was always the divine acting through us. That we were always just instruments, whether we knew it or not, just moving through the karma that has to be moved through, doing the best we can, learning the lessons that we have to learn. Uh, some of my, the most moving lessons I've had about these qualities have come from my dying friends. When you know as many people as I do for as many years as you do, you sort of stack up a lot of people who've died. And everybody dies sooner or later, so it's not a question of whether, but it's a question of how. In fact, there's a wonderful book called Transitions in Grace, which is a story of about 20-some people who have passed uh, on into the next level of their existence, who were either meditating yogis or associated with someone. So that was an influence. And one of the things that I, that is in the introduction to that book is this statement, yoga and meditation has been highly touted for how it can improve you, the way you live, but people are only just beginning to understand how it can improve the way you die, which is a very important thing to learn. So I'm going to use another example. This woman, her name was Brinde. And uh, she'd had a very tumultuous life, very difficult upbringing. Herself became a very uh, committed alcoholic. And in the course of many years of alcoholism, gave birth, I believe, to three or four children and was never capable of raising any of them. So they were all raised by others. I think two of them came out well, one of them didn't. But the, she couldn't hold the marriages and she couldn't hold the motherhood. But somewhere in there, she found the spiritual path and became very devoted to it. And then soon after, she, um, she, she was part of it. She left for many years. She came back. 
And then after she was well established again, she had a terminal cancer. But she was following, by then she was sober and she was following the steps. And uh, she did her best to reconcile with her children. And one or two of them reconciled with her, two of them, one was, one couldn't be found, I think. One refused, two reconciled with her. But here was the most remarkable thing about it. She was just at peace. And I really, I mean, it's hard to think of circumstances that would weigh on your conscience more than what she was describing. But she was able to see it in a big enough picture that she'd realized she'd done everything she could given who she was. And that God himself does not ask more of us. In a humorous way, Jyotish and Devi tell this story. Jyotish is Swami's, Kriyananda's appointed successor. His wife, Devi, the two of them serve as the worldwide leaders. There was some person in the community, this was, they told this from years ago, and he was sort of a difficult person, and he was, uh, they were sort of having a discussion about that man, and Swami said, well, I think he's doing really well. And then he qualified it by saying, considering who he is, you know, which, if you actually think about it, how else can you measure someone? You can't measure everyone against Jesus Christ because we're not. This woman uh, wanted, she was single and she very much wanted to be married. And she read, um, she read about how if you want to manifest something, you should write out a very exact description of what you're trying to manifest. So she wrote three or four pages of the husband she wanted to attract. (laughs) And for some reason, she thought it was a good idea to share this with Swami Kriyananda, so she did. He read all her pages, and then he looked at her and he said, my dear, you want to marry Jesus Christ. (laughs) And then he said, and... Jesus would not marry you. <laughs> and then she said, he said, and you would not be happy with Jesus. You need someone a little closer to your own level. That's how he put it to her. So uh, she wrote two things. She wanted a husband who loved God and who had a sense of humor. And uh, she got a husband who loved God, who has a sense of humor, and God had a sense of humor because he was born on Christmas Day. (laughs) Now, (laughs) going back to, he's doing very well considering who he is, you know? Now, I mean, that, there's so much wisdom in that. There really is. We just can't be what we're not. And if we torture ourselves thinking I need to be somebody else, we're also insulting the divine. You know, God doesn't make junk, as they say. He made me the way I am, and this is the way I am. So later, Jyotish and Devi were asking Swamiji. They had become concerned because of an incident that they weren't sure they had handled it properly. They were asking him, you know, are we competent in the jobs you've given us? Oh, he said, I think you're doing very well. Then with a twinkle in his eye, he said, considering who you are. (laughs) Which made everybody laugh. But that's, that's really what we're working with. We will never be at peace if we're going to wait for everything to be perfect. Because it is perfect, not in the way we think of perfection. We think of perfection as that everything is in order and nothing goes wrong. The way God thinks of perfection is that we're all doing the best we can considering who we are. That we're facing in the right direction And even if in this moment we're not moving, we're contemplating our next step, we're just going to just keep trying. And when we can come to peace, to self-acceptance of this is the karma I have to face, and I may not get through it with 100%. Last night I think I was talking about a situation that I've had to deal with, and I wrote to some friends, I said, you know, It could have gone better, but it also could have gone worse. So I I give myself about a C, on an A A through F scale. I give myself about a C, 
which says I didn't fail completely, but considering who I am, I did better than I might have. And then you can just begin to let it go. And every time I feel anxiety about other situations I'm dealing with, that I should be able to do more, well, no, actually you can't. You're doing very well, considering who you are. So we have to just always keep looking at everything and also understand what, what we have to work on. We think we have to work on our skills, but skill is kind of an odd thing because we just can't be better than we are. But we have to work on our sincerity. And this is how Swami put it to me also, because I, I used to feel that I could use my cleverness and my willpower to persuade people of things they weren't ready to hear. Seemed like a good idea at the time. That's the only thing I can say. And uh, there was a circumstance in which this gentleman, who I thought was receptive to what I wanted to tell him, so I explained things to him that I thought would be helpful to him. And he was um, totally offended to the point where he called Swamiji and told him that I really should be removed from public view because I was a, a menace to the well-being of the people around me. And... Uh, this is the fun of living in community, okay? And so Swami knew, uh, knew all the players well enough to suspect that perhaps the man had overreacted, but he also knew that I probably wasn't innocent. You know? <laughs> so he sort of presented to me what had been presented to him, and I said, you know, of course, it didn't happen like that. And he said, that's what I expected. You know, of course, it was, had been distorted. But then he gave me two pieces. Well, then I said, well, I first said, I resign. I, I, remo- I remove myself from the public view because I'm tired of this. And uh, uh, let's see. Then, then he said to me, of course, you have to think not only of what people, what you might say, but also of what people are ready to hear. Which, of course, the, word, the only word I can think of is duh. Of course you have to think like that. But then much more importantly, what he said to me is, we cannot control how other people respond to us because they are responding from their own complex karmic pattern. And it may have actually nothing to do with you. You simply cannot control how people will respond. Obviously, you should use your brain and do the best you can and love and be appropriate but you can't control it. You're only responsible for your intention. And so that, that, from that experience, that's what I always think of. It seemed like a good idea at the time. You know, even if in retrospect, I could have been wiser, <clears throat> but I couldn't have been wiser because that wasn't who I was. I was responding from my own complex pattern. We spend, as Swamiji says, It's bad enough when you make an error in judgment. Don't compound it by having a complex about it. Oh, I made an error in judgment. I made an error in judgment. How could I make an error in judgment? This woman friend of mine, she did something quite, it was a grave error in judgment. And it caused Swami Kriyananda a great deal of difficulty. It took him a good bit of effort to sort the thing out once she'd started the avalanche down the hill. And about two weeks later, she was still moping about. And Swamiji finally said to her, you know, why are you in such a bad mood? Oh, she said, I just did that thing and it caused so much trouble and so much people had a problem. He said, what egotism? And she she got a little irate. She said, you know, I'm not proud, I'm ashamed. How dare you accuse me of being egoic? And he said, because you're so shocked that you could make a mistake that two weeks later, you're still worshiping it. That's how he put it. Now, isn't that interesting? Because of the fundamental lack of self-acceptance. You know, she just was trying to be Jesus Christ, and she wasn't. It seemed like a good idea at the time. I meant well, or maybe I meant evil, but now I would not do it again. You know, it seemed like a good idea at at the time to behave badly. But then we can just come to peace with things. This is the way it is. You know, you don't want to carry it to the next incarnation. That's why death stories are often really important. My friend got sober. She got on the spiritual path. She recognized she'd done the best she could, given who she was. And I was 
I was honestly astonished and profoundly impressed. She wasn't just at peace. She was in a state of joy, even though the result of all her actions had been so unfortunate for the babies that she birthed. But nonetheless, this is who I was. This is what I've done. And I don't want to worship it for the rest of time. Let me just be at peace. Okay? Do we understand that? It's not that everything is perfect in an external sense, but that we have accepted reality as it is, and once we accept reality, you see, you can build on that. If you're always at war with what is, you have no foundation on which to build anything else. You have no solid ground on which to stand. Whatever the truth is, be at peace with it. And then we can build from that. This chant of Yogananda's, in the temple of silence, in the temple of peace. It's also the chant of his that has the biggest vocal range, two octaves. So really low and really high. So do your best for who you are. And I'll do the same. <laughs> In the temple of silence, in the temple of peace, in the temple of silence, in the temple of peace, I will meet thee, I will touch thee, I will love thee, and coax thee to my altar of peace, and coax thee to my altar of peace. In the temple of Samadhi, in the temple of bliss, in the temple of Samadhi, in the temple of bliss, I will meet thee, I will touch thee, I will love thee, and coax thee to my altar of bliss, and coax thee to my altar of bliss. In the temple of silence, in the temple of peace, in the temple of silence, in the temple of peace, I will meet thee, I will touch thee, I will love thee, and coax thee to my altar of peace, and coax thee to my altar of peace. In the temple of Samadhi, in the temple of bliss, in the temple of Samadhi, in the temple of bliss, I will meet thee, I will touch thee, I will love thee, and coax thee to my altar of bliss, and coax thee to my altar of bliss. In the temple of silence, in the temple of peace, in the temple of silence, in the temple of peace, I will meet thee, I will touch thee, I will love thee, and coax thee to my altar of peace, and coax thee to my altar of peace, and coax thee to my altar of peace, and coax thee to my altar of peace. Peace gave us the mountain. Peace gave us the sky Nightly when starlight enfolds us Peace is its lullaby Amen Amen Peace 
Peace gave us the morning. Peace gave us the sun. Bird songs that call us to welcome. Day and fresh labors begun. gave us the seasons, peace gave us the rain, cool clouds that gather to bless us, mist hands that soothe away pain. Amen. Peace gave us our heart's love, peace gave us our smiles, rays of God's presence within us, light that all strife reconciles. Amen. Amen. So, we've done love, joy, and peace. And so now we're going to talk about calmness. And it's always been intriguing to anyone who studies this, that uh, the distinction between peace and calmness, which is very important to understand uh, for what we're doing. Uh, okay, he's fine. Right. So... I was characterizing peace as we're at peace when we're at peace with ourselves, first of all. And calmness is also a profoundly useful um, aspect of divine awareness. You can see what, what's happening with all of this is we are taking the mystery out of how to be a channel of God, how to be in tune with God. And the, that simple word attunement, which I was talking about earlier about the big radio and the waves being in the room and all you have to do is, you, know, you have to adjust your receptacle. You don't have to create the reality. The reality is always there trying to, or trying to express itself through us. I mean, th this is why we are born. We are all uh, created by the divine. We are sent into this world to be the instruments of the divine. And we get out of tune with that basic intention. So we don't have to recreate anything. We just have to get back in tune with what we were born to do. And, and we know that on some level because whenever we're behaving in ways that is not as love, peace, joy, calmness, we, we always feel off in some way, don't we? We don't feel fulfilled. We don't feel free. If it was our nature to be dissonant, we'd be very comfortable being dissonant. But, but we're, uh, there's a part of us, the divine within us, is always trying to get back home, the river to the sea. That's always what's happening. And when we start living more according to, to this way of understanding, especially when, it, and this is where the wisdom aspect comes in, especially when we get clear about what we're doing, then we start flowing with the actual current, with the current of our own inner destiny. Everybody always asks, why was I born? What is my purpose? And we, we tend to externalize that. I'm supposed to be a dancer. I'm meant to be a healer. I'm, I need to have children, whatever it might be. But none of those things are as important. What you do doesn't matter compared to how you do it. Because you can take any external destiny and make a complete mess of it in terms of the actual development of your consciousness and the freedom of your soul. 
And you can take the oddest life circumstances and make them something magnificent. Just as I was speaking of my friend whose, whose life was, by any ordinary standard, not a success. But the, the, the power of faith and cooperation and attunement that came out of that life, you know, not raising her own children and all the other parts of it, the power that she developed from going through that in such a way that she ended up in tune with higher consciousness. So was that life a success or a failure? You see how different it is? And many, many people who have great power in this world, you can tell that they're miserable and uh, their next lives are not going to be better (laughs) because they're not building anything that's going to make their next lives better. So we have, to, we have to just turn everything upside down. That's why it's very important to be with like-minded people, because what you get from the society is just crazy. We run a school in Palo Alto based on Swami Kriyananda's Principles of Education for Life. It's a worldwide movement. Um, and we happen to have a, a school, and we, it's been there 30 years. And when we for, were first starting, we went on a field trip to a number of the best schools in our area. And actually, 30 years ago, we would put out certain statements about what we were doing, and then we would, they, they were good marketing, and the other schools would pick them up. <laughs> um, but we had a different, deeper understanding of what we were doing. And here's the example. Went to this one of the best other private schools in the area, and in the Palo Alto, Stanford area, believe me, there's a lot that's pretty impressive, or at least has a lot of energy. And so they were teaching children uh, self-esteem. And so they, a part of what they'd done is they had a little visual display. This was like maybe fifth grade. They had a visual display, and every child put leaves on the self-esteem tree. And the leaf had written on it something that, that gave the child a feeling of self-worth. There were maybe 30 leaves on that tree. I read every one of them. 29 had to do with some external recognition of a skill that they had. It was something outside themselves, not their nature. You know, I scored the winning goal, I got 100% on the test, um, I got elected to this position. No, you know, nothing wrong with that, except what happens if they don't get elected? What happens if they trip over their shoelace instead of hitting the winning goal? What if they get a debilitating disease and can't do it anymore, what then? One child said, I'm less moody than I used to be. <laughs> you know, that's, a, that's something that will always be with you. That's a, a power of self-mastery. You know, self-mastery is what gives us, it's the magnetism, you see. So talking about, and, and I praise them for at least trying that hard, but I worried about it because I counseled their parents. I know what it's like, you know. I got laid off from my job. My entire self-identity and self-worth is the job I had. Company cut back, I don't have a job. Who am I then? What happens to me? As you see, it's, it's, it's very inefficient, <laughs> besides being cosmically wrong. So, coming to the concept of calmness, you know, we, we have to understand, it, and I, I want to emphasize, and I will all the way through, We have to access what we are capable of accessing in the moment when circumstances are beyond our... We can't change our circumstances. If you can... If you're in the presence of something that's... Well, being in 12 years of litigation, you can't change your circumstances. The law law grabs you, and you just can't get out of it. And you have to... It it has its own... It's a a never-ending beast that just runs and runs, and you have to keep going. So you don't have the freedom, then, to choose an environment that you want. Or if somebody you love becomes ill, if your child is, has cancer, you can't change your circumstances. So the only thing you have mastery over is how you relate to them. And calmness is one of the, the extraordinarily you know, powerful last resorts when everything is out of our control. 
And it's so interesting how you will, you know, some uh, uh, war hero will be given a medal and he'll have done some extraordinary thing on the battlefield, rescuing, rescuing injured people or leading people in a direction, you know, that saved their lives, you know, many dramatic things. And how often they'll tell you, I mean, they will speak of the experience and it's like everything else ceased to exist and all they saw was their objective. You know, just a deep state of calmness comes in, literally, in the middle of a battlefield. How many great athletes, you know, will tell you when there's 10,000 people in the stands screaming and the other team is trying to stop them from what they're doing, then all of a sudden everything just goes quiet, goes still, and they just move in the direction that they're moving. And things can happen that won't happen when we're like this. Also, if you're talking about tuning your radio and you want to know, you know, what am I supposed to do here? As long as your mind is running in circles and screaming, you know, just help, 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 help. How can you hear anything? And this is why um, all meditation techniques, almost all meditation techniques, come back to the breath. The most classic way to learn to meditate is by watching the breath. Because when, we, when our mind and heart is agitated, our breath is agitated. But just calming the breath automatically calms the mind. I remember I used to be much more emotionally fragile, I would put it, than I am now. I used to cry about things much more easily. It's a great advantage of age. As you can say, I used to. <laughs> okay, And there was a period of time when I was trying to, to manifest the quality of calmness, both for my own sake and for everybody who knew me. I was just trying to, you know, calm down. And so I was going to try to work with, do what I knew about breath. And so I was very upset about something and I was crying about it. So I decided doing, to do just deep, even breathing and I discovered that you cannot breathe deeply and evenly and cry at the same time. In that particular instance, I decided I preferred to cry. <laughs> so I just abandoned deep, even breathing because I wanted to cry. But there are so many ways that we can just calm ourselves down. I mean, and it's vitally important that we do it because the, the power of intuition and higher consciousness happens in stillness. Be still and know that I am God. That's one of the great uh, aphorisms of the world. The still, small voice is how we speak of it. So if our situation is agitating enough that we have to think in terms of calmness, we want to have practiced when it was easier. We want to have, have trained ourselves not to just run away with whatever starts running through us, but to pull it back to center. I, on a longer rhythm than just in the moment, um, I, I, I took up the practice of swimming for exercise. It was actually in the middle of the litigation years. We had gone to Los Angeles for some depositions and um, we were staying in a hotel and at the end of the day, and it had just been a crazy day. I hadn't, I didn't have the right shoes to go into the gym. Everybody else was on the treadmills, you know, like this. But I had a bathing suit, so I threw myself in the swimming pool and I discovered when you swim laps, what is it? Rith even rhythmic breathing. I even use a, a, a snorkel. So it's just a constant breathing like that. And, and I began to understand that tension, stress, Anxiety has a physiological component. And if you can break the physiological build-up, you can break the cycle of anxiety. So for the last 25 years, more dramatically years ago, whenever I would feel my calmness beginning to slip away from me, and I had control over my own schedule, I would, as I put it, throw myself into the swimming pool and just get that breathing, or just run around the block, walk around the block. Just break the cycle so that when you get the habit of victory, you get the habit that I am not compelled 
by my circumstances. I have a choice. Maybe you can't be joyful. Maybe you really don't love anything about the situation you're in, but you can at least be calm about it. This, this, this is what we're dealing with. As, as I've said many times since I came, since I've been talking here in this country, I mean, you can stand against reality, but reality will always win. You just, you can't make it conform to you just because you want it to. But if we can be calm enough in the face of it, what will happen is we will receive intuition. Again, speaking of myself, I, uh, I, I, for the karmic, just psychological chaos, certain things would feel very threatening to me, just usually <laughs> if people didn't accept my ideas. I was very attached to my ideas and very convinced that things had to be done the way I thought they had to be done or else I don't know what I thought would happen. But I had what I called a panic survival response to situations that nobody else saw as, as life and death emergencies. And I needed to be able to, again, to break that cycle. So I began to think, I began to notice that whenever I was moving into that, which was the total loss of calmness, the, the tone and speed, the tone of my voice and the speed of my delivery, I would go from this to this to this to this, like that get much shriller, words would start tumbling out really fast. I mean, some people go the opposite, they go mute. A lot of people around me wish that I would, but I didn't. <laughs> but I began, I began to realize whenever I hear that tone of voice, whenever I hear that voice, it makes no difference what I'm saying, I am wrong. Because I have stepped out of the possibility of being attuned to a higher reality, and I'm totally lost in my own world. You see how calmness can serve us? Just the still, small voice of intuition. We have to be still enough that that whisper can hear us. Yogananda has a beautiful book of what he calls answered prayers. He calls it whispers from eternity. I wish he had called it billboards, you know, shouting. <laughs> exclamations from whispers. But there, that, that in itself is a teaching because we have to attune ourselves because the divine will not impose itself. When I would teach in California this, this path and there would be these masters, people would say, well, I don't want a guru to start telling me what to do and taking over my life. I say, no such luck. You know, if you want guidance, from a wiser, higher source, however you define it, you have to calm yourself down and ask for it. If, if, if it's not, if you don't magnetize it, it won't come. So calmness is one of the single most important traits for us to develop because of the world we live in. We cannot stop it. It's moving so fast. But if we can train ourselves to be calm in the midst of it, everything will be different. Let nothing disturb you, nothing affright you, all things will pass, but God changes not. Patient endurance brings you to victory. Once you have God, you'll want nothing more. God alone, God alone, God alone's all we ever need. God alone, God alone, God alone's all we ever need. Let nothing disturb you nothing afraid you all things will pass but god changes not patient endurance brings you to victory once you have god you want nothing more god alone god alone god alone is all we ever need god alone Will pass, 
but God changes not. Patient endurance brings you to victory. Once you have God, you want nothing more. God alone, God alone, God alone is all we ever need. God alone, God alone, God alone is all we ever need. Let nothing disturb you, nothing affright you. All things will pass, but God changes not. Patient endurance brings you to victory. Once you have God, you want nothing more. God alone, God alone, God alone's all we ever need. God alone, God alone, God alone's all we ever need. God alone. Disturb you, nothing affright you. All things will pass, but God changes not. Patient endurance brings you to victory. Once you have God, you'll want nothing more. Let nothing disturb you, nothing affright you. All things will pass, but God changes not. Patient endurance brings you to victory. Once you have God, you'll want nothing more. God alone, God alone, God alone's all we ever need. God alone, God alone, God alone's all we ever need. God alone, God alone. God alone's all we ever need. God alone, God alone, God alone's all we From the depths of slumber as I ascend The spiral stairway of wakefulness I will whisper, whisper God, God, God Thou art the food and when I break my fast Of nightly separation from thee I will taste thee and mentally say God, God, God No matter where I go the spotlight of my mind will ever keep turning on thee. And in a battle din of activity, my silent war cry will be, God, God, God. When boisterous storms of trials shriek And when worries howl at me I will drown their noises Loudly chanting God, God, God When my mind weaves dreams, dreams With threads of memories On that magic cloth will I emboss God, God Every 
night in time of deepest sleep when my peace dreams and calls joy joy my joy comes singing evermore In waking, eating, working, dreaming, sleeping, serving, meditating, chanting, divinely loving, my soul will constantly hum, unheard by any God, 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 God. It's very important to understand that intellectuality is not the same as wisdom. Intelligence is not the same as wisdom. is not the same as wisdom. Wisdom is understanding what is lastingly real, what causes suffering, and what brings happiness. And that's basically the whole question. When Yogananda came from India, to uh, the United States, to the Western world, basically at that time, in 1920. He published, as soon as he came to America, a little book he called The Science of Religion. As it happens, he didn't actually write the book himself. He gave the ideas to a disciple who was more versed in English, and that um, disciple wrote the book. It was ghost-written under Yogananda's name. So Swami Kriyananda felt the freedom to ghostwrite it a second time, mm -hmm. and he called it, God is for everyone. But the premise of that book is really simple, and it, it's pretty much what I just said. Everyone wishes to escape suffering and find happiness. And all the extraordinary complexity of everything that everybody does is just experimenting with that single impulse to see what the results are going to be. In the 1960s, when uh, my generation was dismantling the moral standards of the country I lived in, <laughs> and creating a, a different story, um, the sexual revolution played a big part in that. And when we were in by the 70s, and uh, most of us who had been part of that had found our way to ashram and realized that the ashram was really what we were looking for. That was what would relieve suffering and cause happiness, but we were still quite wedded to many of our lifestyles. And basically people asked Swami, well, what do you think of all of this? And he represents a very orthodox tradition and spent most of his life as a monk. But his answer was, he said, oh, I'm all for it. He's, and then he, he, he often would do that. He would give you the answer that you really wanted and let you have it for a little bit of time before he expanded on it to tell you that you weren't quite getting what you wanted. <laughs> Most famously for me personally was when I was in a very complex situation, finally extricated myself. And he said, uh, no, maybe the car was over. You know, maybe you're finished, yeah. And I got to just be really happy on that for about 10 seconds, and then he said, but I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> so in this one, he sort of told us what we wanted to hear, and then he said, because you're making experience the criteria of your understanding of life. And he said, experience is the only way we ever come to understand anything, provided you are honest about your experience and not just using our experience to support our biases, which is what many, many people do. I had someone in South Africa 
make emphatic, confident statements about politics in the U.S. and about what everybody in the U.S. thought. I'm standing here looking at it thinking, I'm from the U.S., you know? It's like, why aren't you asking me instead of telling me? But he had a strong conviction based on, I didn't have the energy to ask him later, I wished I had, because I would have been curious. He had this strong conviction based on who knows what, which made him a greater authority than the person who was actually living through the experience. But this is what we do a lot. It's not wisdom, it's prejudice, it's bias. Yogananda said quite simply, reason follows feeling. You ask the question, I use Nazis as a good example, how could so many brilliant people become persuaded that the Jews were really the problem? And that if we just killed all the Jews, then all our problems would be gone. I mean, just on the face of it, how could you become convinced of such a thing? But if there's a something in your heart that wants there to be an answer, just think about it. And so, what wisdom is above all? It requires calmness above a first, because we have to just really stand back and ask, why do I think that? I did have a marvelous experience for more than 40 years of being frequently in Swami Kriyana's company. He was a, a brilliant leader and a true friend and followed all the advice that he gave to us. He exemplified it. So he was always very, um, oh, the only word I can say is ridiculously respectful, sometimes, of my point of view. But when I was foolish, which I was a great deal of the time, there would just be this certain feeling in the room. And so I had the opportunity to, to constantly have to stop and say, why do I think that's true? I watched this, and I watched, um, I watched attitudes before once when I was at a, an athletic club, and there was a hot tub there, and uh, it was just open, and so uh, some of us were sitting in it, and this woman and her daughter, and the daughter was about nine, they came and sat down. The woman, to be delicate about it, I, did not, I do not believe she lived an examined life. I believe she just was following whatever she'd ever heard. So she sits in the hot tub and to make conversation, she said, you know, I prefer the dry heat of the sauna, like that. And her daughter looks at her mother, and the daughter says, I prefer the dry heat of the sauna, like that. And I just suddenly had this picture going years ahead. She's a teenager. The kids want to go and sit in the neighbor's hot tub. She says, I prefer the dry heat of the sauna, like this. She gets married. Her husband wants to put in a hot tub. <laughs> no, I want a sauna. You never do what I say. <laughs> when did it form? She, you know, what did she even know? And it was ludicrous, and I was just projecting. But I could see the woman and the daughter come from the same cloth. So be very, very, very careful when you start asserting anything especially when you're asserting it with an emotional commitment to it. And there's some part of it that you, you want or need or hope it's going to come out a certain way. Just ask yourself, just simply, why do I believe this? And I'm not saying that we can't come to conviction. I had great faith in Yogananda. I had great faith in Yogananda. I did not always understand what Yogananda was saying to me, or what Yogananda had written. But I knew that they, that I could trust them, that they were telling me the truth. And so if my thought disagreed with theirs, I, I had too much integrity to just accept it, but I had too much integrity to reject it either. So I would just put it over here and just wait to see what might be true. And of course, over the years, as I've grown and had experience of my own, I just keep taking all those ideas off the shelf. And I think, well, they fit perfectly. Because now my experience is closer to the experience that was offered to me. So the fundamental wisdom is we're all trying to escape suffering. We're all trying to find happiness. And everybody 
matter how insanely misguided their actions may appear to you, somewhere deep inside of them, it seems like a good idea to them. But we should learn. We should always be standing on the edge of trying to understand, you know, is this really going to bring the result that they want? I have reincarnation as part of my story, so I don't have to worry so much when people do um, evil things. But it, it'll, it'll straighten itself out. It's not up to me. Their own experience will teach them. But it's also very important, and you know, I represent a lineage. And I, I don't speak for myself. I have become profoundly persuaded from my own experience of, of, the, of the wisdom of what I'm sharing with you. But I learned it from those who are wiser than me. And if you are fortunate to find yourself with the opportunity to, to have truly wise, impersonally wise people in your life anywhere, listen to them. Listen to them. Do not sacrifice your integrity to them but be open to learning. This is how we become wise. And if you if you can find a teaching that resonates with your heart, then learn it. I mean, make it really study. All the academics that we learn, these days information is just rife. And too much is not better. But when you find a thread that makes sense to you, that rings in your own heart, follow it and learn it, and get the concept so clear in your mind. When I, I was in, caught in a very difficult situation that involved a hospital and doctors, I was not the patient, but people that I loved were the patient. And it was a mess, and it just wasn't fixing itself. And as sometimes happens in my life in that particular dynamic, you know, I had to hold it together. So I'm in the hospital, and I'm doing pretty good. But I finally had to leave and go where I'm sure, I think the walls of the parking lots, parking garages have seen a lot of tears. And in the parking garage, I'm away from all the people who are depending on me, and I'm just sobbing my poor heart out because it was all so awful. In the middle of all of those tears, I, and I always say it like this, I didn't hear an external voice, but I almost did. I felt like a voice came in that ear, tra tra uh, traversed my brain, and then exited my left ear. And as it was traversing, it said, do you think this could be happening outside the will of God? It just went right through me like that. Instantly, I had to stop crying. Now, that would never have happened if I hadn't spent so many years prior to that trying to understand what is God. What is karma? Why do things happen? You know, does everything happen for the best? Are we really here to learn? You can, you can ask a thousand questions. And if I hadn't, every day, in every situation, asked, how does this teaching apply? What is happening here? How can I learn? What does this book say? Explain this to me. Tell me what you meant by that just on and on and on. But in that moment, I, the, the only thing I could say was, of course it's happening by the will of God. There was no calmness. There was no joy. There was love for the people who were suffering. But in that moment, having committed myself to the pursuit of wisdom, it saved me. And so, but then I said, <laughs> okay, Lord, if this is your will, you need to help these people <laughs> because, and then I was very frank, you have to be honest. I said, because I'm at the end of my rope. And if I go down, I fear this whole situation is really going to go down. And so, and then I came up with the prayer that I've used ever since. Divine Mother, whatever you're trying to teach them, help them to learn it. And then often I add, and quickly, <laughs> faster than the flow I'm seeing. Or pray, for the, pray that they have the wisdom, the receptivity, the humility, the devotion to learn what you're trying to teach them. 
Now you see, you see how that all comes together? Like that? And you see how extraordinarily helpful that is. So sometimes all you can do is just find the underlying philosophical truth that you have practiced, explored, meditated on, uh, you know, understood, because nothing else is going to save you at this point except how could this be happening outside of the will of God? You see, like that? All karma is fair. If it's not the happy ending, it's not the ending. Divine Mother loves us and will only give us the experiences we need to make us free. And if there was another way for us to become free, she would use that method. But you can't just pace those on if you haven't practiced when it was easier. No birth, no death, no caste have I. No birth, no death, no caste have I. Father, mother, have I none? Father, mother, have I none? I am He, I am He, blessed Spirit, I am He. I am He, I am He, blessed Spirit, I am He. Mind nor intellect, nor ego feeling. Mind nor intellect, nor ego feeling. Sky nor earth, nor metals am I. Sky nor earth, nor metals am I. I am He, I am He, blessed Spirit, I am He. I am He, I am He, blessed Spirit, I am He. Beyond all fancy, formless am I. Beyond all fancy, formless am I. Free from dreams of all earthly life, free from dreams of all earthly life. I am He, I am He, blessed Spirit, I am He, I am He, I am He, blessed Spirit, I am He. Bondage I fear not, I'm free in thy joy, bondage I fear not, I'm free in thy joy. Free, oh free, Lord, free in thy bliss. Free, oh free, Lord, free in thy bliss. I am He, I am He, blessed Spirit, I am He. I am He, I am He, blessed Spirit, I am He. No birth, no death, no caste have I. No birth, no death, no caste have I. Father, mother, have I none? Father, mother, have I none? I am He, I am He, blessed Spirit, I am He. I am He, I am He, blessed Spirit, I am He. Mind nor intellect, nor ego feeling. Mind nor intellect, nor ego feeling. Sky nor earth nor metals am I. Sky nor earth nor metals am I. I am He, I am He, blessed Spirit, I am He. I am He, I am He, blessed Spirit, I am He. Beyond all fancy, formless am I. Beyond all fancy, formless am I. Free from dreams of all earthly life, free from dreams of all earthly life. I am He, I am He, blessed Spirit, I am He, I am He, I am He, blessed Spirit, I am He. Bondage I fear not, I'm free in Thy joy. Bondage I fear not, I'm free in Thy joy. Free, oh free, Lord, free in thy bliss. Free, oh free, Lord, free in thy bliss. I am he, I am he, blessed spirit, I am he. I am he, I am he, blessed 
Blessed Spirit, I am He. I am He. I am He. Blessed Spirit, I am He. I am He. I am He. Blessed Spirit, I am He. Walk like a man. Even though you walk alone, why court approval once the road is known? Let come who will, but if they all turn home, the goal still awaits you. Go on alone. Follow your dream, though it lead to worlds unknown. Life's but a shadow, once our dreams have flown. What if men cry, your dream is not our own? Your soul knows the answer. Go on alone, give life your heart, bless everything that's grown. Fear not the loving, all this world's your own. Make rich the soil, but once the seed is sown, Seek freedom, don't linger, go on alone. Walk like a man, even though you walk alone. Why court approval, once the road is known? Let come who will. But if they all turn home, the goal still awaits you. Go on alone, go on alone, go on alone. One of the manifestations of the divine is power. I usually um, also talk about it in terms of energy because it's more practically accessible to us if we think about it that way. But it's also important for us to simply understand that even though material power seems significant, and often when we look at the world we think that the, the government and the bureaucrats and the laws and whether you have money or not, you think that all of these things are really where the power lies. But the power is always with the infinite. Just even looking out the window, you see the power manifesting. You know that could just take everything down. In 1976, which was a long time ago, when Ananda was one community, um, in uh, the middle of June, uh, on a very hot summer day after seven years of drought, um, Half the, half the property was consumed by flames in most of the houses. We only had 20-something houses at that point, but almost all of them burned to the ground. And uh, it's an experience. It, we were in a rural area. It was basically a forest fire. Um, now what's happening is much worse, but that was very terrible. And it just swept over in a matter of hours. It just turned things to ash. And one of the women whose house was burned down completely her, um, her mother, she was talking to her mother who lived in another state, she says, well, you know, certainly you got, you know, your, your clothes out. No, mother, I didn't. Well, what about the baby? Did you get the baby's things out? No, mother, I didn't. Well, you must have gotten your mother. Go to the fireplace, pick up a handful of ashes. She said, that's what I have. The fire just swept through and it just made mockery of our belief that we were in charge. Now, that's the natural world acting the way 
the natural world acts. That's why they won't let us have any flames in here. One little candle, mistreated. Well, there's a lot of cement here, but a lot of other things could be reduced to nothing. But we also have to understand that the power, that God is not gentle Jesus, meek and mild, that there is this force that can move through our lives, just changing everything, whatever it might be, whatever it takes. There's this tremendous capability to destroy, if that's what's in our best interest, to restore, if that's what's in our best interest, to work miracles of health, to just take our life by disease. There's the power of life and death, the power of our destiny. Could this be happening outside the will of God? I want to finish that. I walked back into the hospital, and from that point, everything turned in a positive direction. It was like, oh, yeah, I was the one who had to learn something, wasn't I? You know, it pushed me to the end. And when I learned it, then everything else was able to move forward. But that power is always there. Countless times in, in your life, if you pay attention, you'll begin to realize that somehow there was a power that came in, either to destroy or to rescue, but a power bigger than us. And that we have to also, how do I say it? We can't just be weak. We can't just be just thinking if we're nice, you know, it'll all work out. There's no guarantee at all. There's one uh, exchange between Vivekananda, this is a, whether apocryphal or true, he was an extremely powerful person. He came to the United States. He was one of the first Indian Swamis to come to the U.S. Then the other one was another man we'll speak about at the end of this. Um, but he was a very powerful man, and some very sort of soft-spoken man came and said, you know, Swamiji, I want to realize God. Can you help me realize God? And Vivekananda supposedly said, can you lie? And, no, I would never tell a lie. You, you will, first you must learn to lie with so much skill that no one will know you're not telling the truth. The man looked horrified. And then he said, can you steal? No, sir, I would never steal. Well, you must become so clever at being a thief that you can have whatever you want and you'll never be caught. After you master those, come and talk to me about God. Now, apocryphal or true, I don't know, but here was the point of the story, which is we, we can't just drift our way into consciousness. The manifestation of God is powerful, huge, enormous power. We mustn't be afraid of that power. We mustn't be afraid of that power within ourselves. And also, what passes for piety is not piety, it's either fear or laziness. And that's what supposedly Vivekananda was seeing. This was not a good man. He was just too lazy to pursue what he wanted. And he needed to get a little power running through him. And the power of, of desire, co combined with laziness, <laughs> would move him to become a thief. And once he had begun to have energy moving through him, powerfully moving through him, then he could redirect that energy. So it's notable that there are eight manifestations and not one of them is being nice. Right? <laughs> we have to be wise, we have to be loving, we have to be joyful. So it's not likely that being abusive is going to be part of it, but you've got to have energy in what you're doing. And, and Swami would, would always prefer, you know, somebody very energetic who was way off course than someone who didn't have enough energy for him even to correct. So also from a practical level, from the point of view of, uh, because again, I'll, I'll say the word again, because often we are simply afraid to take a stand. We are afraid to risk. We are afraid to try. We are afraid to focus and try to make it happen. And so we, we, we paced over that, this idea of piety, like this. Yeah. There was this woman in our community, she was so funny. She just somehow decided that, this was way in the early years, she always dressed in white, she always carried one of Master's books, and she would, you know, whenever anything would just, whenever things would become too raucous, 
she would just turn the pages of the book like this. She was so dull. She was so boring. And later, <laughs> later it turned out to be just a complete facade. It was just, there was nothing behind it. It was pasted on from the outside and totally made up. So that's where energy and power have to be part of it. Swami Kriyananda, I mean, he, he was so energetic. He had so much power. He just, he just ran us ragged. We were, we were half his age, and we, it could take a dozen of us even to keep up. One night I was in his house in, in the evening. There were like eight people in the house, and every one of them was working flat out on one of his projects. You know, he just kept so much moving all the time. And he was powerful. And a lot of people didn't like that. They just ran away from that. Yogananda was enormously powerful. And so we just have to realize this is, this is not for the faint of heart, but to speak of courage. But in a practical sense now, from the point of view of when we don't know what to do, we find the manifestation of the divine that is accessible to us. And this is where the word energy is also helpful here. Because sometimes you can't be loving, you're not very happy, but you can always put out energy. And maybe you can put out energy in a productive direction towards solving whatever the issue is, but you can always put out energy. You can always vacuum the rugs, you can always, you know, wash the dishes. When the, it's not always true, but oftentimes when I have a project that I just can't deal with, writing or organization or something like that, I cook. <laughs> and when my housemate comes home basically and sees that I filled the refrigerator with soup and vegetables and salad, you know, it's like almost always like bad day. <laughs> 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 and that's not always the case, but sometimes it is. I just cannot do anything, but I can always put out energy. And when you, and energy has its own intelligence, and energy is a manifestation of God. And when you start moving energy, energy is moving and then it can be redirected. But if there's no energy moving, nothing will happen. Sometimes Swami writes in his leadership book, he says, you know, you should make intelligent, considered decisions. But there's a certain point, he said, where any decision, short of outright madness, is how he puts it, is better than continued deliberation. You just have to move, move things forward. Let me, th just a second, I have a, a thought. You find it for a moment. Um, so when we get in the habit of in every situation, you know, putting out energy and always putting out um, just a little more energy. That's, that's the nice thing about it. Instead of putting out the least, always put out the most that you can. And I, I, I joke about it from the point of view of housework because I'm not, I don't like housework. And I don't mind going to sleep with a whole bunch of dirty dishes in the sink. I know some people can't do that. I sleep like a baby. It's not a problem <laughs> to me. But because energy is a manifestation of the divine, sometimes I'll rinse them before I go to bed. <laughs> because we're putting out a little more than our worst. And, and what, what, what we're doing is we're training ourselves to respond to circumstances with energy. I, would, I know what I'd lost the thought. This woman came to me once, and she was having what I cheerfully called a hundred percenter, which is every area of her life was falling to pieces. Relationship, money, work. I think her health was still okay, but I said, oh. She tells me this terrible tale of woe. I said, well, this is, this is great. I said, uh, you know, it's complete clean slate. You're getting to start over. <laughs> and she looked a little shocked and then thought, well, maybe this is joy, putting a little humor into the situation. But she had so many problems, she couldn't figure out what to do about any of it. And it was, it was a lot of stuff. I said, what do you enjoy? I said, what, what, what can you think of to do that you have energy to do? She said, I love to ride my bike. I said, okay, every time you're beginning to sink down because you're contemplating these problems without a solution, just put them aside, go get on your bicycle, and go ride your bike. And she kind of looked at me like I was crazy. I said, try it, trust me. I saw her about two weeks later, and she had just been following it. Instead of just having these around and around conversations, she would get on her bike and she'd go ride her bike. 
And after ab- about three or four days of this, when she was riding her bike, she started having some good ideas about what to do. But if she had just sat there, and, and, but she just said, I can't put any energy directly toward the problem, but if I put out energy, I will be getting in tune with the expression of the divine, and then that will take me where I need to go. You understand? It is almost always, of course, sometimes if the problem is that your physical body is collapsing, you might not feel you have any physical energy, but you can always put out mental energy, you can always put out spiritual energy, you can always pray, you can pray for others, you can sing, you can listen to music, just if you collapse to here, try to bring it to here. Just that much of a change, because the divine has power. And so it's not logical, it's not an A equals B. Don't think about it too much, just do it. Because as soon as you do it, you begin to tune into a different frequency. And then everything falls from that. None can atone me, say who would injure me. None can atone me, say who would injure me. The world turns aside to make room for me. The world turns aside to make room for me. I come all blazing light, the shadows must flee. I come all blazing light, the shadows must flee. Hail, O ye ocean, divide up and part. Hail, O ye ocean, divide up and part. Or parched up and scorched up, be dried up, depart. Or parched up and scorched up, be dried up, depart. None can atone me, say who would injure me. None can atone me, say who would injure me. Beware, O ye mountains, stand not in my way. Beware, O ye mountains, stand not in my way. Your ribs will be shattered and tattered today. Your ribs will be shattered and tattered today. Friends and counselors, pray waste not your breath. Friends and counselors, pray waste not your breath. Take up my orders, devour up ye death. Take up my orders, devour up ye death. None can atone me, say who would injure me. None can atone me, say who would injure me. I ride on the tempest, astride on the gale. I ride on the tempest, astride on the gale. My gun is the lightning, my shots never fail. My gun is the lightning, my shots never fail. I chase as a huntsman, I eat as I seize. I chase as a huntsman, I eat as I seize. The trees and the mountains, the land and the seas. The trees and the mountains, the land and the seas. None can atone me, say, who would injure me. None can atone me, say, who would injure me. I hitch to my chariot, the fates and the gods. I hitch to my chariot, the fates and the gods. In the voice of thunder, proclaim it abroad. In the voice of thunder, proclaim it abroad. Howl, O ye winds, blow, bugles blow free. Howl, O ye winds, blow, bugles blow free. Liberty, 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 om. Liberty, 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 om. Okay, now that you have the idea, let's do it with energy and power. None can atone me, say, who would injure me. None can atone me, say, who would injure me. The world turns aside to make room for me. The world turns aside to make room for me. I come all blazing light, the shadows must flee. I come all blazing light, the shadows must flee. Hail, O ye ocean, divide up and part. Hail, O ye ocean, divide up and part. Or parched up and scorched up, be dried up, depart. 
or parched up and scorched up, be dried up, depart. None can atone me, say who would injure me. None can atone me, say who would injure me. Beware, O ye mountains, stand not in my way. Beware, O ye mountains, stand not in my way. Your ribs will be shattered and tattered today. Your ribs will be shattered and tattered today. Friends and counselors, pray waste not your breath. Friends and counselors, pray waste not your breath. Take up my orders, devour up ye death. Take up my orders, devour up ye death. None can atone me, say who would injure me. None can atone me, say who would injure me. I ride on the tempest, astride on the gale. I ride on the tempest, astride on the gale. My gun is the lightning, my shots never fail. My gun is the lightning, my shots never fail. I chase as a huntsman, I eat as I seize. I chase as a huntsman, I eat as I seize. The trees and the mountains, the land and the sea. The trees and the mountains, the land and the seas. None can atone me, say who would injure me. None can atone me, say who would injure me. I hitch to my chariot, the fates and the gods. I hitch to my chariot, the fates and the gods. In the voice of thunder, proclaim it abroad. In the voice of thunder, proclaim it abroad. How low ye winds blow, bugles blow free. How low ye winds blow, bugles blow free. Liberty, 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 home. 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 So we have two more expressions of the divine that we want to talk about, and they are sound and light. And both of these, they, they go together. Both of them are talked about in the, in the uh, um, Christian Bible, or in the Jewish and the Christian Bible, the Old and New T- Testament. In the, you know, and the Lord said, let there be light, and there was light. That's just, that's right how it, it begins, isn't it? And this is, uh, it's not just poetry. They're really speaking of what we discover when we go into the esoteric inner universe, we see the light. In Jesus he says, if thine eye be single, thy whole body will be full of light. And the yogis speak of, we don't have an example here, but when you meditate, you see the spiritual eye. And the spiritual eye is a, it, everybody sees it. It's a, it's a golden ring, it's a dark blue field, it's a white star in the center. Go to the Vatican, go to St. Peter's in Italy, in Rome, Italy, you go into the huge Vatican Cathedral, and you and they have this. It has a name, but it's basically like a uh, an open a gazebo right in the middle of the giant place, which is enormously beautiful. You walk in and you stand in this huge gazebo, and you look up. You're looking at the spiritual eye. It's a gold ring. It's a dark blue field. And I think they have a dove in the middle, because that's a five-pointed star. The dove has his little. Uh, tail in his two arms. That's what the dove is, too. I mean, these are just the way things are. And sound, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. What is Word? Word is a way of saying sound. It's not like the written Word he's talking about. He's talking about the sound. So we also meditate listening to the sound of Om. And again, it's what people hear. It's not like somebody's idea of what you might hear. You may have heard it sometimes when you go out in nature. It's just this, 
it's not just the sound of nature, it's, it's the sounds that nature makes. It's the sound of creation. And all saints of all religious traditions, light and sound are part of it. So what we have to work with also is how do we take that esoteric, because we can't always, um, we can't always compel these experiences. We can believe that they're possible, but we can't necessarily compel them. So let's use sound as, a, as what we'll talk about first. And, and sound being a fundamental vibration of the universe is what we're, we're working with. But sound has this tremendous effect on us in all sorts of ways. And I'll start w- with it from this side. Be very attentive to the sounds that you bring into your world. We can't always control the sounds around us, but insofar as you can control it, because our, we are made of sound vibrations. And that's why they can, you know, now it's so common, ultrasound and ascending sound vibrations. We heal and change the body with sound waves now, because we've begun to discover that what appears to be physical can actually be changed by ultrasound. You see, some these things start manifesting themselves to us and we don't even notice the implications. But from the point of view of our thinking of being a channel for these qualities, well, first I was saying, sound has a, a profound effect on us and we should not be casual about it. The way Swami put it is, music, speaking of music, not only reflects consciousness, it creates consciousness. There's a horrifying story of this woman who committed suicide, but by the grace of God she didn't die. She went into the, she went into the astral world, but she came back, death and return. Near death, they call it, but she died and then she came back. And she was a great devotee. I think at that time it was called heavy metal music. I don't know what. Very, very cynical, very life-denying, very um, sensual, very egoic, and she actually killed herself while listening to that kind of music. She went into the nether world, and she found, she, she realized that she'd gone into a world where suicides go, where people have completely denied hope, which is another word for God. They've just denied everything, and she could tell that a lot of them had been sitting there for a long time, be it by their clothes or by their demeanor, she could tell. And they were all discouraged and depressed. I need to put this word in. People commit suicide for different reasons. And the karma of suicide is just, well, that didn't work, did it? How did that work out for you? Not very well. So we get to learn. So it's just like any other karma. It's a hard karma, but you'll get over it. I say that because I never know in a room who I might be talking to or what your experience might be. But in any case, she went there, and this is how she said, the vibration of despair that I encountered there, and people commit suicide for different reasons, and the karma is different depending on the reasons. That's what I was trying to say. That's also, it's, it's very individual. But she said the, car, the, the, the vibration of despair was exactly like that music I'd been listening to. And that music had become her consciousness, and as a result, she took her life. And uh, she said she'd never been a religious person. This is the story she tells. But she was sitting there realizing what had happened and what had caused it. And just the word Jesus came into her mind. Jesus didn't mean anything to her, but just the word Jesus. She knew what it meant. But, and she said, as she said that, she looked up. And as she looked up, she realized that there were countless angels above them, beings of light, who were all there trying to lift up the energy of the people who were in despair. Because if it's not the happy ending, it's not the ending. And so as soon as she looked up and saw the light, she realized, I don't want any part of this. She repudiated that whole way of being and went up into the light and then she came back into her body because it wasn't her time to die. Now it's a very dramatic story about music, isn't it? What kind of sound is permeating where you live right now? I mean, you don't have a choice when you go out, 
but in your own home you have a choice. Is the television always on? Is the radio always on? Are people shouting at one another? When you have a choice of music, are you listening to the news? What are you doing? What sound are you bringing into your world? And do you want to become the vibration of that sound? Because you will be. On some level, you'll be reflecting it. These days, it's great. You can always put your own earbuds in and dial on your phone something you'd rather hear, even if your whole family has a different taste than you do. Pay attention. And then the other side of it is, what kind of sound are you expressing? In very simple words, what kind of language do you use? How do you pronounce your words? Are you really giving when you talk? Do you know that anybody else is in the room, or are you just talking because you talk? I had a relative, uh, not a relative, but a friend, which uh, uh, by the right word, someone that I had an acquaintanceship with, right? And um, she was marvelous, and I used to joke about it. She, she talked all the time, but she just never seemed to know there was anybody else in the room. She just was constantly making sounds, just keep, keeping noise going. But she never actually communicated. She just made noise. So what kind of sounds are we emanating? Are we communicating? Or are we just making noise? What does our voice sound like? What is the tone of our own voice? If you just heard that sound, what would you think who that, who that person is? Are we swallowing our own words or are we so busy thinking about ourselves that we can't really guess? And, you, know, so, 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 you know, sometimes we, people talk and they just get their words to about here and then they eat them again. You know, like that. <laughs> I used to mumble a great deal, and Swami told me that I, I really didn't want to communicate, which seemed odd to me at the time, but he was right. I just had this desire to share, but I was so worried about myself that I never could get, really get the words out. You know, their sound has a great power, and what, what we emanate is a, is a great description of who we are. Is this, is this who I want to be? You know, practice it. Swami Kriyananda had a unique way of speaking English, a unique accent. He spoke eight languages, so he was like that. But he finally, he finally sort of just said I, he, about himself, he said, I speak English the way I think it ought to be spoken. <laughs> Meaning, I just choose because I just choose. But it was melodious and it was lovely. And, and why not? Why not be like that? Not all of us can sing but almost everyone can speak. How are we speaking? You know, and, and, and that, that runs through you, you see, constantly. In the beginning was the Word. So what are we going to pass through us? And don't ever underestimate the transforming power of singing uplifting music. Swamiji, these songs were all received and they are the vibration of this path. It's not, so, someone asked Swamiji, what's your uh, what's, what's the question? Oh, what's your favorite music? And so he said, mine. <laughs> and then he heard how that sounded. He said, no, that's not exactly right. He said, first of all, because it's not mine. He said, I received it and I passed it on. And he said, you didn't ask me what I think is the best music. He said, because I wouldn't have said that. But it's his favorite, he said, because it matches his own vibration. And from the point of view of those of us who wish to get in tune with this line of teaching, the vibration of that music is the same as the vibration of the masters. And so listening to the music, singing the music, even if we don't sing it well, just that's who we become. And by contrast, whatever you sing, you will become more like that. So sound is a really interesting and easy one for us to work with, bringing it in and passing it through. Okay? Let's see. What should I do here? I'm just thinking about time for a minute. Maybe I should speak about light, and then we'll do music for both of them, just one after the other. Speaking about light is also... Um, there's, of course, the divine light that we see. I was talking about uh, what I was talking about. Visions of light. You know, the, the everybody, again, who has either... Many people who have 
spiritual experiences or near-death experiences and actually leave this world, there's often a very bright light that comes to us. A figure emerges out of the bright light. The light itself speaks to us because it's a fundamental building block of creation. It's, it's how the divine manifests the material world, is through the power of light. I don't know anything about Einstein's theories and all of that, but the speed of light, you know, there's all this wonderful mystery around this. And as we move into a more esoteric experiences and meditation experiences, all that light becomes part of what we're doing. But just as we were talking about sound has an extremely um, pedestrian, everyday way of exploring it, just to speak of sound again. There's this incredible conspiracy in our society now, you know, to impose upon us the most dissonant possible sounds. And it's not a small problem. I'm a, I have been for many years a one-person campaign against horrible music in public places. But uh, I am trying to be more calm. I was in a, a a, a grocery store that I went in to buy some laundry soap and the laundry soap was on a lower shelf and there was, at least in the U.S., there's way too many choices. So I'm on the floor trying to figure out among the laundry soap which one and I'm having a horrible time choosing laundry soap, which is like not a big project, generally speaking. <laughs> and I'm just wondering why I'm feeling so sort of helpless and oppressed. And I actually, because I was on the floor, I looked up and there was a loudspeaker right above my head. And because I'm used to tuning it out, the loudspeaker was playing, I can't use the word music, they were, they were playing a, a pattern of sound, which was, which was like people torturing each other with brute instruments. And I, I literally, I was like pinned to the ground, and I couldn't make a decision on laundry soap because I was being attacked by these vibrations. And I'm making light of it, but it's no joke. A lot of what's going on in our society these days is that the, that the so-called music, which is everywhere, is attacking our well-being on a regular, <coughs> steady basis. I mean, for this reason, I think losing yourself in a world of your own earbuds, if you have good choices on your device, or just simply avoiding those places. I went, the one-man campaign against this, I went to the manager and told him, I came here for laundry soap and I'm leaving without it. <laughs> you know, what makes you think it's anybody wants to hear this horrible... I was on a holiday once and a, a, I was in a condominium and uh, I hadn't yet sort of explored where I was and I decided that they were having a public execution down by the swimming pool. That was the only possible explanation for the cries of pain that I was hearing emanating from the pool. But it was somebody's idea of what you would want to hear on holiday. Okay, now having said that, I've satisfied myself. Let's go back to light. But light also is a very, it's a very practical, real issue. Light is color, and you know, light is what comes in from the outside. And so think about, again, think about your environment. And this room is not terrible, but this room is not doing real well either in terms of the colors you have surrounded yourselves with. A few of you look pretty good, yeah. Many of you don't. In the, in the congregation, the community that I, I lived in, I live in still, but I used to, almost every Sunday I would, I mean all the classes and everything I would give, and I've taken a, an initiation that has me always in this beautiful shade of blue now. But this was, this was now 12 years ago, but for 25 or 30 before that, I had choices. And when I started doing more public work, I went to a color consultant. I, you know, just because I, I was not a natural girl. I mean, I'm, in, I'm a natural girl. Now that means something different. I'm not, <laughs> I'm a natural girl. But the art of being a girl, it, I never understood, so I got somebody to tell me how to be a girl. So she told me how to be a girl. She told me the colors and styles and the jewelries, and I just followed her perfectly, and I looked good all the time. And every time I gave a class, I would think really carefully, like, you know, what... Because you all have to look at me, for heaven's sakes, and it's, it's hard enough to persuade people of these teachings. If I'm an eyesore, it's not going to help. And if they think that I don't know how to dress myself, it's not going to help either. So. All of that. So I worked really hard at it. And then fashion comes in. And gradually, 
Everybody in the room was dressed in black. You know, just week after week after week after week. Finally, I just got really annoyed. I said, you know, you're not thinking about it, but I have to look at you. And all I see is just row after row of black. Like, have a little mercy. I'm, I'm thinking of you. Think of me for a change. You know? And to their credit, the people in my community, even if they were still wearing black, they would put a color scarf around their neck. But it's a serious question. Color. Color is a vibration. This woman who uh, was, mar- was and she doesn't, she's retired now, unfortunately, but marvelously gifted. She, was, she wasn't just a fashion consultant. She was like a color, a color healer. And she was, she was able to tell uh, the colors that would just bring out your life force and help you to be who you were trying to become. I mean, I, many, many of my friends benefited from her extraordinary expertise, but I really, because I was involved with her for 20 years, I really began to understand what it is. This is light, you see, this is color. And why, why work against ourselves in any area? Why not take advantage of everything that we can take advantage of that will lift us into the vibration that we want to go? It's not a matter of vanity. In fact, Swami, Swami Kriyananda put it, well, I, as I said, I didn't, uh, I didn't know how to be a girl for a long time. He had to intervene, really, literally, <laughs> to get me to understand how to just dress appropriately, that was all. And, uh, but he said, look, he said, other people have to look at you, <laughs> you know? It's not really for your own sake. He said, it's a matter of courtesy. He says, if you take the trouble to just think about it, you don't have to be vain, you don't have to be expensive, but you're emanating a certain color and you're, it's, it's vibrating through you. It's, it's literally vibrating through you all the time. You're attracting magnetism based on what you're wearing and it's, it's running through you all the time. Why waste that? Why waste it on something that doesn't give you anything back? Like that, you see. Swamiji, uh, he used to, uh, he traveled to Thailand and also to India, and he um, would often get, he had a beautiful collection of, of colored silk shirts, you know, that he would just wear because they were so beautiful. And they emanated the light, and they uplifted everyone around. They uplifted him, and they uplifted everyone around him. Look at the home you live in. Just walk in, as if you, if, as if you were a stranger. And you know, is it is it light filled? Is it bright? Is it shadowy? Is it dark? What kind of colors do you have? What kind of pictures do you have on the wall? You know, is is it is your atmosphere? Is your environment bringing light? into your life? Or is it sucking the light out of it? Or is it just neutral? You know, it doesn't require a great deal of money to do any of this. It just requires a little bit of thought. And it matters, because everything matters. You know, everything matters. Everything either contributes, well, if you're lucky, it's neutral. But if it's neutral, it's also taking away, because habits are building and age is encroaching. And what we keep repeating just becomes who we are. Another interesting part of it, Swamiji said once, is that when you come into the material world, you try to recreate the astral world that you came from, which is an interesting way to put it. When we uh, first took over the apartment complex, where we now have a community in Palo Alto, it was a kind of a rundown place. That's why, how we could afford to get into it. And uh, a lot of the people there struggled they struggled in life. And so interesting, um, the apartments where the the struggling people lived often had very dark carpets, very dark furniture, and the the curtains were kept closed. You know, the accoutrements, everything was uh, downward pulling and confining. And we moved into the same apartments, you know, put down light-colored carpets, painted the walls white, put in skylights, opened the curtains, Same, same box. But the astral world we came from was full of light and color. The architecture is terrible, so it's not like it's great a great building, but we just put our astral world into it. Ask yourself, who do I want to be? 
What am I manifesting? And then in every small way that you can, just start shifting it. You see? And even if you feel uncomfortable, you start small. If you, if you, if you already have invested in a great black wardrobe, just get some colored socks. <laughs> <laughs> or a little necklace, <laughs> you know, or a tiny bracelet. Just move toward the light. And then, of course, the other, the other definition of light is light. Not weighty, not heavy. And in our education for light, life system, um, we talk about the uh, specific gravity if children are heavy or ego active or light. And, and then we're not talking now about light, uh, emanating light, but just light. We're not heavy weighted. Sometimes you, I see people uh, walking down the street, and I, I, I'm smart enough not to imitate them when they're there, but sometimes I'll go, I'll go home later and you'll see people who are just... You know, they're just... They hit the ground hard and their energy is like, you know, here. It's like they're always trying to go back to the earth. And then some, you see other people who are just... Everything is up, up. It's uplifted. So again, just watch others. You can learn from them. And then think about yourself. You know, do I feel weighted? Do I try to lift up? Where, do, where, where are my eyes habitually? You know, where is my heart habitually? What, what am I doing with myself? And in, in many circumstances, you can bring in light just by bringing in lightness. You know, just we don't have to be so heavy and serious about this. Let's just be a little lighter about it. Let's have a cup of tea. You know, let's tell a joke. Let's listen to music. Let's dance a little bit, whatever it might be. Just bring a little lightness into it. Sometimes you literally just have to open the curtains. You know, just change, change the vibration from downward pulling to upward moving. And again, these are things that you, you begin to practice. When you're in an atmosphere where you feel it's a heavy atmosphere, what can I do to lighten it? When we have been uh, responsible for helping people to transition out of their bodies, um, we often try to bring Swami Kriyananda in there chanting Om. We have a recording of it. And just put that in the room because, it, because it's very calming and it, it moves the energy upward because you can have weeping relatives, you can have people who are frightened about all of this, lighten the atmosphere. Bring in pictures of the masters. Bring in beautiful things. Change the dull coverlet to something, you know, bright blue that lifts the energy. So ask yourself also, am I, am I heavy or light in my own consciousness? And what can I do to lighten it? What will change it? I was uh, in a period of time where I was really annoyed I was having a dispute with some people and um, they weren't listening to me. And I wanted them to listen to me. So I would have conversations with them a lot in my head when they weren't in the room. <laughs> and I, uh, I often go from where I live to where I swim on a bicycle. I have an electric bicycle. And uh, I would have these conversations with the people while I would ride. It was awful. It was just terrible. And I happened to mention to one of my friends, you know, my brain just won't stop. And, and she's the choir director, Karen, where we are. And uh, Swami has a, little, a song called Little Kathy. And it's, it's, it's a nice song, but it doesn't have the power of what we've been using here. Little Kathy went dancing, went dancing, went dancing. Little Kathy went dancing, went dancing one day. She went out in the garden, the garden, the garden. You know what I mean? It just goes on and on like that. She meets a little bird, you know. It's a nice song, but it's, it, it doesn't move me like the others. She said, sing little Kathy. I said, Pff. She said, sing little Kathy. <laughs> I said, okay. And so I'd start down and as soon as the brain would start going, because I'm just going down this. I don't sing particularly well, but I won't sing well enough. I go down the sidewalk. I just started, you know, blasting to the sidewalk. Little Kathy went dancing, went dancing, went dancing. It changed the mood from heavy to light, just like that. And I used that for quite some time until I stopped having those conversations. But it was partly because it wasn't a big story. It was just this little girl goes out dancing in the garden and meets a robin. Like, big deal. But it was light. 
It was really light. So watch yourself when you're feeling down. What movies are you watching? You know, what television am I watching? What conversations am I having? What books am I reading? Follow the light. I sing your song and sorrow's gone in joy I live ever free. You fill my heart with music, I dance through life with thee. I sing your song and sorrow's gone in joy I live ever free. You fill my heart with music, I dance through life with thee. I sing your song and sorrow's gone in joy I live ever free. You fill my heart with music. I dance through life with thee. I sing your song and sorrow's gone in joy I I sing your song and sorrow's gone in joy I live ever free. You fill my heart with music, I dance through life with thee. I sing your song and sorrow's gone in joy I live ever free. You fill my heart with music, I dance through life Silence came the song of creation. Out of the darkness came the light. Out of the darkness, out of the silence, thundered the cosmic sound. Amen. Out of the darkness, out of the silence, thundered the cosmic sound. Oh. Our bondage with the dawn of new freedom. Gone is delusion in the light. Gone is our bondage with the dawn of new freedom. Gone is delusion in the light. Gone is delusion. Gone is your bondage. Thunders the cosmic sound. Amen. Gone is delusion. Gone is your bondage. Thunders the cosmic sound, oh, 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 out of 
the silence came the song of creation. Out of the darkness came the light. Out of the silence came the song of creation. Out of the darkness came the light. Out of the darkness, out of the silence, thundered the cosmic sound. Amen. Out of the darkness, out of the silence, thundered the cosmic sound. Om, 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 Om. Gone is our bondage with the dawn of new freedom. Gone is delusion in the light. Gone is our bondage with the dawn of new freedom. Gone is delusion in the light. Gone is delusion, gone is your bondage, thunders the cosmic sound, amen. Gone is delusion, gone is your bondage, thunders the cosmic sound, oh. Gone is delusion, gone is your bondage, thunders the cosmic sound, amen. Gone is delusion, gone is your bondage, Thunders the cosmic sound. Oh. Let's just end with a prayer. Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father, Father Divine, Mother, Divine Mother, Friend, Beloved God, Friend, Beloved God Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ Baba Ji Krishna. Baba Ji Krishna Lahiri Mahashaya, Lahiri Mahashaya. Swami Sri Yukteswar, Beloved Master, Master. Paramhansa Yogananda, Yogananda, Saints of all religions, of all religions. Dear, friend Swami Dear friend Swami Kriyananda, humbly we bow to all. We, bow to all. We, are we are deeply grateful to have shared this time in your presence. Bless us that we may be your instruments and awaken your love in all hearts. Om Shanti Shanti. Amen.